MVP Black and a surprise loss to Tempest now has to fight their way through the lower bracket of the Eastern Clash. I'm Gillyweed here at the desk with Jay Howe and Dreadnought. Guys, so far Korean teams, yes, maybe they've lost to each other, but really are an unforgiving opponent for anybody except maybe in a European team. Any chance we're going to see Soul Torchers be able to do it here? I'm g I mean, I'll be honest, it's going to be unlikely. Uh, but MVP Black has shown that they are not you know, un unbeatable. They are very much a vulnerable team that seem to be riding on emotions. And right now, their emotions cannot be on, you know, the higher end here. Granted, they probably are very confident going into Soul Tortures. They generally don't have much respect for opponents that aren't out of the Korean region. So I can see it kind of going both ways, but I don't expect it to be dead even, right? It's going to be very polar for either way um, here for MVP. They showed a little bit of disrespect towards Deadly Kittens day number one and Deadly Kittens put them to the brink in their second game. So I think things like that definitely do stand out when I think about where we see MVP Black right now. There's a few things that, yes, we have a small sample size right now in terms of games played, but we've had some discussions backstage, and I want to see if some people might be trying to maybe manipulate the drafts in favor against some of these players on MVP Black. Yeah, I think that's such an important point that I really want to get to when we talk about the drafting of MVP Black. Have a discussion with both of you guys, but first, let's check in with the schedule because we are halfway through day two of the Eastern Clash. And as you can see, if you missed MVP Black versus Tempest, you missed out. Please go watch the VODs of that series and then L5 did get that 3-0 victory over TFC it was it was a stomp it was a stomp definitely for L5 there and now we're going to see how uh, the sister team the team from Taiwan Soul Torturers can do versus another Korean team MVP Black except this time it's elimination and when we talk about these teams we talk about how teams from league regions approach those from non-league regions it does feel a lot different between the western and the eastern regions whereas in the west we hear a lot of like well they're really good at team fighting because that's all they get practice in we're just going to out macro them but dread it doesn't seem to be the same case for the most part except maybe how l5 approached that last match yeah because like i mean a north american if i'm team freedom right going against nomia oftentimes you go well when they do end up playing within their own region it's inevitable that they get to team fight but the odds of them understanding how to play levels one through nine uh being able to take out enough front walls getting a talent tier advantage early on and then you go well i don't care how good you are team fighting you're just a talent tier down and it feels like now it's like the other way around that l5 is more dependent and the rest of the Korean and Chinese teams on getting that out macro uh, play and then trying to avoid the team fight directly. I don't know. It's just kind of interesting to see that kind of play out. I just confused that back end. Sorry about that, but you can go ahead. No, it. It, no it does <laughs> seem like what you were saying where uh, a lot of teams have been approaching the matches in a way of like, I'm just going to win this fight as fast as possible because I see myself as a better team than you. And that's gotten them in trouble with some of the regions, like you said, with Deadly Kittens. But L5 last series did start to bring more of the macro play in. But let's get started with our teams. We're looking at MVP Black for this first series. First series of the lower bracket of the day is what I meant to say. And here they are, MVP Black. We have to start looking at the drafting of MVP Black now, Jay Howe. They have in the past, for a long time, been hesitant to change off of what they deem are the most powerful picks. And it seems like a lot of that falls now on Rich, not only because he is the drafter along with Reset, but on his hero pool. It is something that stood out to me at BlizzCon is that we had shifted more towards a double warrior meta sometime around September of last year and we saw a lot of changes around melee assassins, things like that, and we saw a new approach, and it forced Rich onto heroes like Chen and Leoric, and we know Rich loves to be aggressive, he loves to kill people, that's what he does, watch his stream, watch him play, he wants to be on heroes that can kill people, and he's actually struggled, it's almost like they just have this nail that they can't quite get through this wall, and they keep hammering it until eventually it gets through, we've seen a lot of Illidan, we've seen a lot of the Medivh, things like that, it's just like he's really trying to force it more than, say, open up a little bit and maybe play more towards what we would consider a more neutral meta on his role. 
And not only that, the play style that those heroes uh, typically fall into are very linear and have one way to be able to approach the team fight most of the time. I mean, granted, in the past, that was the meta, so it really kind of worked out for them quite often. Uh, but then in their ability to try and react to what has kind of evolved post, you know, it, throughout all of the year in 2017, it just feels like they have been unable to do so, at least so far. In all of phase two, this team only played double support if it was with Tastar, and they never played double warrior. I think one time Rich played Colossus Smash Varian, and then yet we saw Reset play Arthas in the last series versus Tempest. So we saw that change up that we haven't seen since the mid-season brawl when he was playing Chen. And we even saw them go back to an MVP black style of draft that we haven't seen in quite a while, which is that slow play, the Lee Ming and Sergeant Hammer on Battlefield of Eternity. Do you feel like that last series versus Tempest was sort of a wake-up call maybe and that they haven't really been challenged in draft for all of phase two yet? It really did actually feel like a wake-up call in the sense that it's like, all right, we're gonna continue to press the issue, press the issue. And then eventually they're like, man, like this isn't working working out as well as we had thought. And Tempest just turned a lot of those fights and made that one hell of a series. And also it's like, maybe we should be a little bit more reactive with our drafts as opposed to just, we're gonna impose our will on the enemy team. And I think that was definitely something, but doing that in the middle of a tournament setting, falling back to old values is never an easy thing though. And we also have to look at maybe how this tournament kind of unfolds with the Easter Clash specifically versus like the mid-season brawl. At international, global specifically, we have almost a week where every Korean team gets to practice against every other team in the world. And honestly, half the reason Korea shows up and does so well is because they can execute so very well compared to the rest of the world. But they learn the meta in that one week's time. If they fail to have that time to be able to learn, we know that they can be stubborn in the past and suddenly you get like, this formula for a worst case scenario tournament performance, even if maybe you were the best team. Well, they're going up against the Taiwanese team, Soul Torturers, so let's check out these players. As we talked about earlier, Soul Torturers, as well as a lot of the non-league region teams here, all of them have surprised in their ability to team fight very well, and especially even be able to draft in a way that keeps up with the Korean teams, the Chinese teams, and allow them to bring really bring it in the team fights. The problem still comes in when maybe they win a team fight when they're down, and they're just so far down they can't quite catch back up in time. It really does feel like there's been a shift in the meta, specifically because mouth L nerfs, Genji nerfs, things like that, that we saw a lot of these Korean teams playing over the last few months. Heroes that still shine in their own right, but are nowhere near as powerful as they used to be. And I think that some of those meta changes, and again, the semblance of we're going to continue to run this, run this, run this, has actually made it easier for some of these teams from the other regions that might play a little bit different style and can capitalize on that. Dread Soul Torturers, both games versus Super Perfect Team yesterday, did get behind in the early game. Maybe they lost a pick here and there. Maybe they just didn't have the, quite as fast rotations. But yet their superb teamwork in team fights is what allowed them to come back in the games. And while that is a strength that they do have together, is it something that they can bank on being able to do versus MVP Black? I, I, again, I, I do expect kind of a polar performance for MVP Black, and I can see them maybe catching me off guard in a negative manner, but right now I'm going to say probably not. I still think that the execution of team fighting is really going to stand out here for MVP Black, and if I am Soul Torturers, I immediately go, how can I force them in, not, in draft into an awkward moment, and then how can I win to the early macro game in levels one through nine, get that advantage, and that is when we see MVP Black panic drafting and falling behind when they don't expect to. Well, it all starts with the Battlegrounds. So we check in with the Battleground pool now for this best of five to see what each of the teams banned and where we will go for game number one. MVP Black once again has banned Braxis Holdout. Soul Torturers ban Dragonshire. No a surprise there after the last Dragonshire. It does seem to be the new MVP Black map, j -Hal. This is MVP Black. Uh, we talk about records during HGC, but if you go back to DreamHack Summer 2016. It was like when they just, you talked about it earlier, the six minute game. I just want to point out, okay, I know we're getting into the draft. MVP Black, 
all of them look like, man, I don't think we're supposed to be here. Like, this is not where we expected to be in all their faces. Then I look at Soul Torchers, they're like, this is a good time. Like, <laughs> the mentality, either MVP Black's going to come out, come out and be like, we need to punish these people and we're mad, or we might just slip up because we're not supposed to be here. Well, look at where the pressure is in this series. Nobody expects Soul Torchers to defeat MVP Black, the team who was expected to maybe even pull a Fnatic run and not lose a single game, and all of a sudden they find MVP Black facing them in the lower bracket. It's got to be a little bit of a surprise happening on both sides of it, but it's how MVP Black is able to regain their morale after that difficult loss versus Tempest. And I often talk about this with you, uh, Gilly, and when t looking at the North American teams and in our broadcast, I mean, there is no opponent more scary and more intimidating than one that doesn't have anything to lose. MVP Black is expected to take this. They're expected to not only take it, they're expected to take it dominantly. And if Soul Tortures, again, can catch them off guard, maybe the momentum and the tilt will come into play and the MVP Black will struggle. I, it's, again, I, I I think it's going to be unlikely, but I'm not going to say it's impossible because it very much has been displayed that it is within the realm of MVP Black, even when they're this confident. We just cycled through about 10 heroes there. Yeah. Uh, they ended up settling for the ab of their ban, and I wonder where MVP Black stands on this. I mean, we've seen them play a lot of Illidan, no matter the map, things like that. Taking the Abathur away, we see finally the Aureole that has been banned out so much in this tournament, making it through here. Exactly. MVP Black is changing up everything we know about the meta right now for this event by not banning Aureole in that spot. But it does allow them to have Vala and Tassadar, but Soul Torchers get Aureole, which has been a fear of so many teams at this event. It does. This is one of the cases where I don't mind prioritizing the Vala on the side of MVP Black if your goal is to remove the battery solely because of the map. It synergizes with the Tassadar rather well. It denies yeah. the possibility of a Tass Tracer coming in. So I think it's a safe and well-educated rotation here for MVP Black, but by no means does it kind of stand out. as like, you know, they're going to be fine here in this game as long as Soul Tortures is effective here in their 2-3 and more importantly, the secondary ban phase. Very rarely does a second, third pick before the second ban phase necessitate a Lunara pick, but I feel like Here, if we're yes. talking about Battleground, things like that, you first picked Ario, you don't have the Vala, and you want to try and manipulate ma fights in your control, objective in your control, I feel like this is one of those times where you have to do it before that second ban. The question is, though, if they end up going with that, do they commit to, okay, it's going to be a Greymane and a Stitches instead, so no Lunara. Re battery now might be able to be banned out by MVP Black, but... To be frank, MVP Black's secondary ban this entire tournament has been questionable at best. If I was to put out a single point in a lot of the cases where MVP Black struggles in the draft, this is it. They fail in this territory where they kind of misinterpret the strength of their opponent and kind of remove something that it's not that it's necessarily out of the realm for their opponents to pick, but is it the key, very, uh, key factor they need to overcome them into a draft? Can't Soul Torture's not worried too much about having the battery as long as they have someone who can still do well in the race because Cassia is still in availability and if MVP Black feels like they have to ban Cassia because they want to get their Illidan and then in that case they'd still be able to get Lunar after all. It, it does. I mean, we see them teetering back between Arthas and Cassia and that is just screaming, we want to run Illidan. We want to run Illidan with this cop. It does. It screams that. And again, it hits that point of stubbornness, right? Because it could be a situation to where, like on, on, your, on your question, Gilly, it's yes, if MVP Black is remaining with exactly the same picks all the time, but a better team or maybe a more accepting team of the outcome and with circumstances they're under would ch uh, make that change. They would no longer focus under that. So it's more of Soul Torch just kind of calling out the stubbornness and MVP Black essentially falling in line. Maybe I... Is there a world where they'll say, we're okay with you taking Illidan here? I think there's a world, is it worth the risk? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty big risk when uh, the risk starts uh, with the name Rich. Malthale has to be a bit of a focus too, considering his accent towards the map objective itself and into Ariel. AoE healing reduction is a rather beneficial thing. Uh, but either way, you can see Soul Torture is putting heavy consideration here into the secondary ban. I'm assuming it's gonna be the Illidan. No ban is a throwaway. The thing is, the thing is, Illidan is what they know, right? If they start to ban Illidan, then they start to 
That's go, a really good point. Yeah, go in a way toward maybe not being able to control the draft. But MVP Black don't get Illidan yet. They're leaving that spot to flex. With the last pick, you can do this. And I guess the thing to me is, if you're Soul Torchers, when was the last time right. you saw MVP Black run Volatas Li Ming? I they ran Li Ming earlier today in Battlefield. But We're, with but this, Sake, Tassadar, yeah. Reset, Vala, I mean, in what world does Rich play one of these backline heroes? Guys, we are overlooking a huge hole here uh, that I just noted now that the Tyrael Rhaegar is locked in. There is still a world where if they do not take a cleanse support, it is a Judgment Task Tracer all-in composition, and who cares about the That's rest true. of the Illidan and all of the Dance? Granted, you know, it is, Rich is in a situation to where... I, I guess, actually, now that Kyoch has transferred over, who is the Tracer? Reset. It's Reset and Reset. Is so they, and then I, Rich I think, would be on a carryless well, hero, Rich which is, is unlikely. Rich has played it too. Reset played it earlier, so it could be either. I just, I automatically yeah. see that and I go, well, if you do not have a cleanse, I don't have to Illidan. Granted, again, that has been such a staple and they've displayed being stubborn, oh. so it's oh. taken away. And the Uther on the other side, so it's a double support. Oh, man. Everything on the side of Soul Tortures here is very, very powerful. And there's a Tracer. Woo! This draft just got flipped on its head <laughs> real quick. Going Uther Illidan on your own. So how does Ariel fit into this? Relying on a gray main as the Ariel battery has been proven not to be the most effective. Y yes. Teams will do it here and there. I would say he is not of the tier class as a Vala or as a Lunara. Um, Cassia now up at the top, but he does still, we've seen people be able to have success with it and he does have so much damage. They care a lot about having the damage for the race that that is a concern, but I'm, I'm wondering if they are ready for the Tracer. That look on his face, he looked over. He's like, you run that Illidan all the time. Watch this, hold my Gilnean cocktail. <laughs> all right, in the red, we've got Soul Tortures from Taiwan, Scroll playing Stitches, 005 on Illidan, God Dog playing Greymane, and the rest. Well, we will have MVP Black on the left, and as we talked about who would be the Tracer player, and that is going to be Rich as we see Kyocha on the Rhaegar reset will be on that Vala. We'll see exactly how much damage this team can put out and how much they commit to the races. We do see Vala going into that Q build for BOE. She'll have that Monster Hunter for the bonus damage on the... Ba really for the Immortal, that's the big deal to have it here on Battlefield of Eternity. That's why it is almost really the norm, the normal build that you'll see here with some fluctuations occasionally, a lot of times in North America, especially in, when running with an Ariel. But in this case, that will be providing a lot of damage and it only provides more as you continue to ramp up in the Hungering Arrow build, getting Puncturing Arrow, getting Repeating at 7 as well. I like that we see both teams respecting the potential push out of one or the other, and they've just kind of postured around the middle. Now we'll see kind of this 3-2 split, 3-3 three, three in the bottom, 2-2 two, two in top, and you got to wonder with that Tracer being up there with the Tassadar, obviously that can go well as God Dog being very aggressive, taking some damage in return, but now Tiss is trying to get the kill. He's going to Eldruins out, but a little too late as first blood here in favor of Soul Tortures. Cucumber comes in with the heal, making sure that God Dog is staying alive through any potential follow-up damage from MVP Black. So Soul Torturers will walk away with the first kill, and that's what we wanted from ST. We wanted them to make sure that they bring the aggression from the beginning, because generally these non-link regions suffer when it comes to a macro game, and Soul Torturers have such impeccable teamwork when they work together. You know, Dredd had brought up in the draft about either having the cleanse or something like that and the potential tracer that comes in, but picking up that Uther there, that potential armor that you're going to have to mitigate some of that damage, things like that. This Soul Torturer's draft caught me by surprise, Gilly. I actually like what the way that they're playing it now. I actually like what we're going to see as Scroll is going to be the primary target. He's trying to get out of there. He's got the heals, and there's the armor right there suppressing the damage from the Pulse Bomb. Later on, uh, Quantum Spike becomes... Oh, oh my! Reset! Uh, becomes a way of being able to pierce through that armor. But for now, these early game picks, that Uther is invaluable to Soul Torturers getting through the pulse bombs of Tracer. We've got the first Immortals fighting, spawning. Let's see how it works out for these teams. 
Well, we see Reset and team making their way up. Zola in all kinds of trouble. No way Oriole's going to make it out of there. And MVP Pine returning the favor, getting a kill of their own. But the race now, Gilly, both teams kind of split up trying to get this to the halftime show. Yeah, it is fairly close. MVP Black and having that power play. We're able to work down the Immortal Health Bar more. Soul Torturer is playing it passively. You can see in their positioning, they understand the situation they're in. And the worst thing they can do here is get into further staggered deaths. Yes, death, death timers are shorter, but it also means that they can get another 5v5 fight right here before the Immortal phase is done. And they even have the level four advantage for a slight moment. They had it. You know, the way that Soul Torturers is playing is actually very MVP-esque because this is something where MVP, they like to play the Immortal, but they're not afraid to team fight when it comes to moments like this. Kind of like an old school throwback as Bowie trying to get out of there. The Eldruins might obviously on the backside, but Soul Torturers is postured up very aggressively. I think they're finally going to commit to just saying, hey, let's cut our losses. We're going to lose this, but let's make sure it doesn't have a really big shield. Yeah, the best thing that you can do versus MVP Black on Battlefield of Eternity is make sure that you don't get too far behind. And there's two ways to do that. Make sure that you're matching in the experience, in the soak. If they're soaking a side lane, you soak a side lane as well. Also, if they're going to get Immortal and you know that it's inevitable, you can go in and try to get the kill, but realizing it wasn't going to happen, work down the shields as best they can so that MVP Black don't take a lot of structures along with this Immortal. Well, we're going to see exactly how much they can get out of that, Gilly. We've got about a half shield on the Immortal. Obviously, you want to get that down into that melee range, see if you can get that in, poke a little bit safer. They're solely reliant on Greymane in this, in that human form. The rest of the team, pretty much melee there. Zola trying to do what he can on Ariel. Shield is down, so they'll have a little bit easier time clearing this up from here on out. Now, the well is forfeit. MVP would love more ideally, but they're going to take the fight beyond the Immortal oh, Resets oh, oh. in danger. Soul Torturers take out Vala. Tesla trying to get out of there as well, getting the Altruins, but Pui's got Ooh. other things in mind as Scroll lands the hook as well. Zola's going to eat a lot of that damage. He's going to survive, but Gilly. The Immortal took out about half of that fort. I'd say it's a pretty winning trade there if you're Soul Torture. Absolutely. It was going to do damage here, and there was the potential for a lot more if MVP Black were able to take that fort down and aggress on top of Soul Torturers. So Soul Torturers dictating that fight, getting the kills in that way, you can tell the benefit of that in the experience bar. You know it's good when uh, Tyrael was momentarily leading in hero damage, getting that trade value, right? <laughs> good use of trade. There you go, Tyrael. <laughs> Adding the stats. Even without, e uh, even in death, too. <laughs> Nicely done. That purge evil does help a lot, though. It gives you that extra damage. It's not too bad, not too bad. But either way, we're going to see both teams. They're prioritizing the impalers here. The camps will be picked up, but you obviously see the teams fall back here momentarily to get those shaman camps, try and time those around the immortal phase. And I tell you what, Gilly, I'm actually looking forward to this as we see an invade here, though, as Sake is going to have to dimensional shift out. But look at that. Yeah, no following, trying to make sure to get the stun after that. Instead, Sake gets away with the dimensional shift, but ST will happily take the camp, keeping the pressure on to MVP Black. And, I mean, I don't want to advocate Wizen Duelist here for Grandma, but he's thinking about it. Oh, oh, he did it. This is hybrid in the truest sense. We've got going into the Worgen at one, the Cocktail at four, and then Wizen Duelist. You got to stay alive if you're going to do that. So we'll see exactly how much this team does as they continue to dive in. Maybe they're looking to stack this up early, Gilly. Man, what guts does God Dog have here? There's one kill. They take out Vola. But they're going to need a whole lot more when they want to stack up a Wizen Duelist screaming. And as you said, no deaths, which means the double support must be on point. And that basically paints a target for Tracer now on top of Greymane's back. It definitely does, but with that double support between the RL, the potential Crystal Aegis, as well as that armor from Uther and the potential Divine Shield, maybe you go that route to just help protect that Greymane as he gets stronger and stronger in the late game as we see the early aggression here Four Soul Torchers giving that extra time to put some pressure on the Immortal. All eyes on God Dog now. The Pulse Bomb goes down, but doesn't connect on him. He's still there. We've got a cleanse helping it Tist out of danger. But still, MVP Black pushes back ST. ST very nearly took the Immortal of MVP Black to half health. Hook dodged. And the whole thing about this is that Shaman Camp ended up getting picked up, Gillian. It's actually going to be pushing that top lane. It should make for an easy rotation over. But as you can see, MVP Black starting to put that pressure on there. And we're going to see the halftime show kicking off 
as well. Both teams pretty even right now in experience, so we have a potential for another fight coming up here. Yeah, Black made such an awesome rotation that ST took them a little bit to make sure to move up and get the halfway point. So MVP Black got a whole lot done there just because of how fast they could read the positioning of ST. Hook lands, Ooh. Rich used a couple blinks, but he's okay. Oh my God. Guys, I'm out, but there goes Bowie. He's going in, trying to put the pressure on. There's that pulse bomb. He gets a spread damage, but that armor from Uther is going to keep him alive, and Bowie's going right back in, Gilly. God, dog's fairly low. A lot of members of ST actually pretty low, but the hook lands. Reset taken out. Ooh, man, scroll. We talked about him yesterday. Still making a name for himself even a year later. It doesn't matter what hero he's on. He is a high-impact warrior for this team for Soul Tortures. Jay Howe. It's Battlefield of Eternity, <laughs> and MVP Black are not winning right now. Say it ain't so. They lost on this battleground to Tempest as well, and it was amazing to see that a team has been able to adapt to MVP Black's style. Granted, that was a completely different style that Black is running versus Tempest. It was more of the older, slower style, and this is anything but that. But ST hit 10 first, and they have the immortal abilities, or the <laughs> heroic abilities with the immortal. Can we make a brawl of that where you get to play as the immortal, just a bunch of five immortals stomping around, then have the abilities? Can, can we do that? Yeah, totally. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> I want to do this ability right here. Yeah. <laughs> we got to come up with a name for it, but we'll work on that later as the immortal. Spin the win! Spin the win. You know, I've, Soul Torchers is staying around quite a bit. They're looking for the hook, looking for Scroll to go in. There's the Crystal Eaters already as the Hunt's coming in as well, but the Cleanse and the Ancestral is going to land on time on reset. Bowie continuing, and Sake, though, on the wrong side of this fight, the stun going in. They're trying to finish this, but so far, no kills. Scroll recognizing he's going to go down ends up being the lone death in that fight. Yeah, it was important for Scroll to turn back around because this is the Protect the Grey Main style of composition, and a lot of the members of ST were, were already low. Crystal Aegis was out, but Sake does love to flank the way he does on a Tassadar, and it makes him really scary the way he is able to get onto the backside, especially to put a lot of damage on backliners specifically. And once he dimensional shifts in, he goes into Archon form because he knows he has dimensional shift back up again because of the reset of that ability. It's something that he and Lockdown do very well in the Korean region. Double E across the battlefield as MVP Black seemingly regained a little bit of control, but by no means has one team taken a huge lead at all as Scroll going in. Maybe looking to take that fight, but they're going to instantly dive on him. The Pulse Bomb's going to be there as well. He heals, but the Ancestral right on time. They're going to continue the pressure as Sanctification goes down. Once down, but Scroll lives. Can throw out a hook once again and catch his Tiss. He's going to Gorge. 005 is doing a lot of damage, harassing Saki in the back line. Now it might be the turnaround. Tyrio gets hit. Zola doesn't have Crystal E just to find Storm. Stops the rest. Oh and a recall is forced from Rich as God Dog goes for the throw, taking around. Oh, God Dog going in. You can see the damage. And they are putting it to MVP Black right now. We have 25 seconds before the next Immortal. We have the Shaman Camps available as well. Gilly, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Soul Tortures is up seven kills to two over MVP Black here ten and a half minutes in. I feel like if Soul Tortures wins this game, ends up winning it, we are going to look back at that moment and feel that it is a defining moment. Yes, a team can get an early lead versus a team that anyone sees them as the better team, but once someone starts to regain the momentum the way MVP Black did, you can start to turtle, you can start to second guess yourself. But Soul Tortures stepping back in again for a fight there shows a lot for this team, and that has allowed them to continue to have a slight advantage over MVP Black, but they cannot ever let control go. Gilly, sometimes these immortals come down to RNG, and we got a little bit of RNG in favor right now of the viewers, because right now it's on the enemy side, so teams are gonna split out. It will push a team fight here in a moment, but right now Soul Torture is trying to get 13. They take down the fort. Fort was weakened earlier on. Got the slam trying to dismount and watch for the positioning of Tess so that Scroll can maybe be able to get that hook. Gorge is back up and it's a scare. With 13 available, Soul, Tor Soul Torturers will get onto MVP Black's Immortal and start taking it down. I believe there was a dimensional shift used there on Tassadar to try and evade that hook. So that's something to keep an eye on. Dimensional shift on a much longer cooldown than the hook that's 16 seconds. But here we go. It's on the friendly side. They're willing to commit to the defense again. It looks like God Dog might be going over to take advantage of that Worgen form. He's staying in, in the zone for the moment. Yeah, this is a tricky spot for Soul Torturers now. They want to use 13 to their advantage. So they're going to send people back and forth, but they can't 
get too far separated or MVP Black will strike just like they're doing now. If the hunt comes back in, stun oh. divine swarm on the immortal stun, Rhaegar is down! Reset's gonna be the second to fall and Tist on that backside trying to use that Eldruins to get out of there. The knockback is not enough to push him away and Soul Torchers are gonna fall back, claim their prize and get themselves another immortal, him Im immortal here. Uther is going to continue to watch and see if anyone tries to whittle down as Oh, wait a minute, portal. wait a minute. This They're sneaking it. Than you realize. Sneaking it in on the backside. Oh, they overcommitted no. to try it for the race though, Gilly. Little bit of maybe a miscalculation for ST. Woohoo, we got seven stacks seven. on that Wizard Duelist. Nice. Shades of 2016 here. I believe that's 3% attack damage per stack, correct? It's mucho lots. I didn't know we were going to speak in Spanish. You want to do a Spanish cast? <laughs> No. Okay. Uh, so we have the defense here of the Immortal for Soul Tortures. There's the hook, the Gorge. Can they get the follow-up? Remember, that is straight in there. Or excuse me, not Tracer, but Reset. He's going to go. Sanctification. Going to keep him alive. With the heal. Everyone's still living for Soul Tortures, too. They can make another go at this if they want. MVP Black ready to continue the fight, knowing that they are down. But every time MVP Black dive on top of Soul Tortures, Soul Torturers live through it, and they could re-engage with the hook. They're looking for it. They're getting out into position. Bowie recognizing they're going to go out there. Scroll not going to be able to get there in time as Sake's mounted up. Kyoja far enough away on Rhaegar to where they just walk away. And right now, structurally, Gilly, despite being down 10 kills to 2, MVP Black has the lead in structures. They do, and that goes back to the conversation we had before with an understanding of how far you can push your limits in the macro game. And it's even one reason why we've seen non-league regions be able to win fights is because sometimes our Korean teams are willing to say, we might lose here, but we can take out a keep in the meantime. Yeah, we might lose a fight, but we have all of our structures up. We have those capabilities. And even though they lose three or four heroes, they still end up with the experience advantage. They have the opportunities to find those situations in their scrims, whereas it's not always an option for our non-league region teams. But man, I'm so impressed with Soul Tortures and how they have been able to maintain this level lead. Soul Tortures is in a five-man prowl. They were walking through the enemy side, hoping to find a fight. They're gonna get that down the hunt, and they are going Reset. in and get locked down as Reset's gonna go down, and that is a big pickup for Soul Tortures. They just can't keep her alive. I almost wonder if maybe it would have been more beneficial to have Kala's Light over Kala's Embrace for Tassadar, get the armor off of those shields, because if it's relying on her to be able to attack, but she's just running away all of the time because Soul Torturers are hunting her down with the Divine Storm and with the actual hunt, I don't know. Soul Torturers walks in and says, I'm taking this. And they do. Immortal spawning in eight seconds, and ST have a level lead with 16, 16 talents here over MVP Black in game number one of this best of five. Elimination match, the hunt goes in, j -Hound. Kyoja in all kinds of trouble, but the Pulse Bomb in return, not gonna do enough damage as Kyoja goes down and Rich going the wrong way on the battleground. God Dog is like, can I get him? No, but they can get themselves a Tassadar and the hook's gonna miss, but do we have the cocktail? Is it available? Let's see if he's gonna go to disengage. I'm guessing that cocktail might not have been available, or he thought maybe it's just been too long. I was wondering if maybe ST would stick around there a little bit longer, take out the towers in front. All this time, Tist has just been free taking down towers on ST's side of the battleground to make sure that they can get to 16 and have an opportunity for another fight. But it will give some time for ST to get a lead on the Immortals yet again in this phase. They're getting a lead, and we saw that graphic a moment ago. Highest hero damage for Greymane also has completed the Wizen Duelist. And remember, if he dies, that resets the zero. But we're talking 16. You've got Executioner. You've got all these things that do that bonus damage now. And Greymane is the most terrifying hero on the battlefield right now. If he dies, yeah. But if he lives, God Dog <laughs> is a legend. I'm telling you. Now he's got Executioner. Let's go. Oh, the detainment strike, the hunt. Nice cleanse, though, early on to reset. But Bowie turns around, and they get the kill directly onto Tracer. And now they've got their eyes set on Tisk. But the Holy Ground is going to separate them as well as that. But Tisk comes right back in. Down. Done. 
would make sure that he goes down. Oh. Ball is next too. Soul Torturers are running rampant over MVP Black right now. Poor Kyocha. He's like, guys, I just, I'm just i trying to make it to the dog park. If you could just leave me alone, stop harassing me. Oh, but they got themselves Sake. He's going to be in a little bit of trouble. The stun, the detainment strike, and that is a five-man team wipe for Soul Torturers. They are running all over MVP Black and Killy. They have their eyes set on the core. Who is this team right now? ST comes in, they go down to the lower bracket, they take out SPT, and on Battlefield of Eternity, they take out the Keep, and they're moving on to the core of MVP Black. You've got yourself an Illidan, you've got yourself in front of you. Hop on, boys, we're going for a ride as Illidan's gonna dive all over this bad boy, and Soul Tortures has taken game number one off of MVP Black. I, I I, heard myself say that and I still don't believe it. Look at those faces. I'm tell there was something to be said about when we did the, the intros and everybody on the side of Soul Tortures, they're having a good time. They, you know, they have no expectations to come out and win this and MVP Black on the other side look completely dejected as in like, guys, this isn't where we're supposed to be. Their mood was definitely down. And so right now, it's just a matter of Soul Torture's shocking everybody on MVP's best map, historically, and their map choice. Hello? It was a doozy. <laughs> Eight, was it 18 kills to do at the end of that? I don't exactly know, but I do want to start out with, if we remember to the draft, I was like, guys, 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 there is no cleanse on the side. Imagine the tracer judgment combo that might be able to come in. And then the Uther pick up and still committing to the Tracer here for MVP Black, I think it's pretty clear as, you know, a lot of the problems that kind of came in online. I do want to highlight, though, 005 stun onto Kyocha <laughs> to be hit with the Immortal stun immediately after there. That was a absolutely flawless initiation coming out from him. They did that about a million times being able to combo off the Immortal stuns. That was 10 kills to 2. This is 13 kills to 2. And it's about to be, numbers about to go up here in a minute, I imagine, from this replay, Dread. Yeah, they're about to, you know, move in. Nice attainment strike once again coming out from Zola there to prep everything up. But the, this Uther stun combo coming out from Cucumber. At that point, Tiss finds him on the wrong side. He gets a nice holy ground to be able to buy a little bit more time. But once again, scroll with an amazing hook, drawing him back in there. And at this point, two members down. Doesn't matter. Illidan's going to chase you all down and make sure that he ends up getting all the kills. You know what's really cool, and I just realized this, is they recently role swapped and they put Zola on this support role and the previous support was Cucumber. So it would make sense then that we have two awesome support players for uh, Soul Torturers. They really showed up. Very convenient, you know, when the double support meta hits that you have two past support players. Sometimes you queue up in quick match, you're like, look, I'm just going to play this hero. I'm probably going to pick some wild talents. But man, if this all plays out well, this is a good time. I'm hopping on this gray, man. I'm like, guys, I'm going Wiz and Duelist. Please keep me alive. And then he just wrecked everybody. I do want to say that there was an insane risk by not going Divine Shield that game. Like, oh, yeah. it, they went from what was, I felt like, almost unwinnable composition at that point, unless MVP Black snowballed levels one through nine ridiculously to like a. If they fail this initiation, especially stacking, because like oftentimes people fail to realize this, whenever you Aegis to save a target, you're essentially removing their damage. So if you use Divine Shield as a deterrent at the same time as Aegis, not only did you use two heroics, but you are no, by no means ever going to get a kill with that Divine Storm. So you failed, and it happened early on. They actually failed the ability to get the kill. But after that, they held their own, they didn't stack the two, and then suddenly they were able to turn it. So, I mean, I commend Soul Torturers for being able to get the win even after going that direction, but I mean, I'm still skeptical. If moving forward, they want to pick Wiz and Duelist, go into the double support, and not go into the Divine Shield. Gilly, Dredd is telling me that an 18 kills the two game leaves him skeptical. He just said it was risky, but the risk he paid off. He said skeptical. And they're absolute legends now. <laughs> Divine, I'm getting out of here. Divine Shield with Wiz what and Duelist. What do they have? And normally you need that. I kind of need yeah. my microphone to talk into as well. Really? But you're telling me, what do they need to do to prove that this isn't a fluke? You, Come on, Dredd. you got to realize, like, I am never satisfied unless it's <laughs> perfect. Like, I am never satisfied. If I can find a hole, I'll bring it up. But, you know, that's half the beauty. You're the winning side. I'll still critique. You're the losing side. I'll definitely critique. So, j how you know, uh, if you want, you send you're me replays. I'll go ahead and... You were happy with that hamburger at the hotel you told me about. Yeah. So. 
I don't know what the one time I've heard him satisfied. Let's see if he's satisfied with the map for game number two. (laughs) Let's check it out. Let's see what's happening. MVP Black now with the choice of first pick or Battleground choice. They've chosen first pick. Soul Torture says, all right, we'll take you to Shrines. What do you think my response to that is? And since we're on the satisf- satisfaction, zero to ten, where do we where do we think we lie? I think you're pretty happy with that. It's a kind of a, it's a little bit lower actually. Really? I just feel like, even though that game was amazing, and yes, it was dominant. The much like the Korean versus Chinese teams fighting together and going to Sky Temple, why would you take the strength of your opponent and pick a map that accents it? It's not that. I'm not saying Soul Torchers can't do this here, and it's just one of those cases where I'd rather you just go, well, I know they're struggling at the macro game overall, that they can tilt rather easily. I'm going to take them to Tomb, even though they've been great on Tomb. They prioritize Tomb within their region. Every game they've had at this tournament on 